Í, í dag ætlar Chris okkar Pampúli að, að vera með erindi um, um hérna, etiana og, og loðnu, mjög áhugavert erindi. Uh, ég ætla að segja hérna í upphafi að, að, að ég þarf því miður að, að fara mjög fljóðlega en það verður hérna tími á eftir til þess að spyrja Chris og endilega nýti, nýti tækið þegar að spyrja með viljið. So, switching to English. Chris. Uh, Chris did his undergraduate studies in biology and master's degree in oceanography in uh, Montpellier in France. He did a PhD in ecology and evolution at the same university, university and graduated in uh, 1999. Uh, in his PhD, he was uh, investigating the effect of severe floods on uh, reproductive biology of Scopies in lagoon system with Scopies, right? I think, yeah. He then did one postdoc at the University of uh, Louvain in, in, in Belgium, uh, where he studied population genetics for two years, uh, followed that and went to Finland, Helsinki, Finland, where he studied behavioral ecology. He then joined uh, our institute in 2002 as a postdoctoral student working on cod genetics. Christoph's research interest focuses on the application of gen genetic genomic tools to fisheries management and conservation, and his lecture today fits nicely within that. So, Chris, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation, Nir, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So today I'm going to speak about the use of uh, eDNA to try to assess the distribution and abundance of, of capelin. It's, it's quite a catchy title, and it's a project that we started uh, in 2018, and that was funded by Rani's Technithron Studer. It was a bit delayed. It was supposed to last for three years, and, uh, but it, it lasted four years because of the pandemic. So there are lots of collaborators there, and, but the, the project was mainly done between uh, um, our institutes and, and Matisse. So before I go in details into uh, the project, um, I would like to say what is eDNA. Actually, um, it's fairly easy to explain. As we stand here in the room, we are actually releasing eDNA. Okay, that's environmental DNA. Uh, I will call it eDNA. Um, so because we are losing cells from our body, from the skins, from the hair, everywhere. And it's the same with organisms. They are actually releasing constantly cells in the environments they are occurring. So it's the truth for a bear that is scrubbing his back on the tree. It's uh, the truth also for uh, animals that are pooing and peeing, which are most of them, and also swimming in the sea. But there is one thing that I'm not going to do today, is that I'm not going to speak about what this picture is showing, biodiversity. So most of the eDNA studies are about studying biodiversity evolutions, and that's a specific approach. I'm going to speak about a species-targeted approach. So we are only going to look into the DNA of capelin. And yes, it's not. I'm not going to talk about the frog, but, but, but capelin, yes, just to be sure. Um, the other question that we do really often have is that, why are we interested in eDNA? Why eDNA instead of something else? Well, I might remind you that uh, lots of publications have been appearing in the last 10, 15 years suggesting that we are actually facing the six mass extinctions of species in the world, and that's the biggest one since humanity, um, yeah. So, and uh, when we think about this, uh, we think of course about our impact, uh, human activities, and, and also human research. It's also including the fact that to study stock assessment, for example, we have to kill many, many, many fish. Uh, so there was this brilliant idea that we could use some non-invasive and non-lethal technology maybe to uh, study things. And it's even more alarming when you're actually looking at how many species we do have on Earth, because all the statistics, ah, say that again, statistics that are based, um, um, well, that we are using to assess biodiversity decline are based on the fact that there is only 1.2 million species described at present on Earth. And the estimate is that we could be around 10 to 100 million species on Earth, which means that basically, you know, if you look at those numbers, approximately 86 to 91 percent of life is not described. So it is quite alarming. 
And uh, Pierre Tabelet and Anko in 90, I think it was the first time you mentioned that was 1998, actually. So you saw, you see, eDNA took a lot of time to come in the mind of researcher because the first book that was published on this was 2018. But so he was saying and suggesting that in areas that are not really easily accessible, like the Orinoco rivers in Venezuela or in the mesopelagic deep layers in the ocean, we could use other techniques than just trolls or destroying the forest to try to understand what kind of biology is around. Uh, and I could show you many, many other examples like deep sea organisms and then uh, the Madagascar stone trees, forests. Uh, well, you know that one. You know, we are not so far from it. So those environments are not really, really easily studied because they are not that accessible. And the creatures that are living in them are not accessible. So um, the idea was that actually using environmental DNA, so DNA that is released by um, organisms when they are living in an area, in an habitat, could be actually collected. And that will help us not to disturb the, the, uh, the animals, but it will also help us to see its movement and its presence in the area. So that has been done on, on carnivore detections in Sweden, actually, with lynx. Uh, it has been done with water oil water samples in, uh, in Australia where they actually found out that one of the species of birds that they thought was extinct was actually not extinct because they found the DNA in the water. And uh, many other examples like the Olm salamanders in caves in Slovenia. It was so, thought to be totally extinct and they found traces and then they sent robots in the caves and they found it. So it has many applications, but of course, one of the things you have to remember is that to do environmental DNA, you need to have a sequence for the organisms that you are studying. That's, that's the prime uh, things you need to have. So why Kaplin? Uh, Kaplin, because you probably all know this story. Um, this is the distribution of Kaplin prior to 2002. So Kaplin is a fish that is actually spawning in the southwestern area of Iceland, uh, which is represented in red there. And um, the fish actually die after it spawns, and the larvae and, and are actually drifted towards the north of the Iceland, represented in blue there, which is a nursery area. And when they are growing, then they move in the green area, which is the feeding area. And that used to be uh, in the Icelandic sea, uh, north of Iceland and southern part of Jan Mayen. But all of a sudden, in, uh, after 2003, this is what happened. Uh, the feeding area and the nursery area of the Kelpin totally changed and shifted towards waters in the East Greenland area. And uh, if you look a little bit further, this actually got consequences onto the fisheries, because if you look at the logbook, and this is a paper we published in 2020, then uh, the left um, figure is actually showing you the periods before the changes in distribution, and you can see that the fisheries based on the logbooks, these are the four first weeks of January. They are mainly located in the southeast part of the country and really concentrate in the southeast part of the country. But after the changes, then the, uh, the fisheries got spread much more and they are going from the north to the southeast of, of Iceland now. So because of all these changes, we wanted to know if we could actually track or detect Kaplin using eDNA and see um, if we could actually, yeah, try to estimate its distribution around Icelandic waters. Uh, the other objective was to try also to quantify it, not only detect it. So based on a certain concentration of DNA, can you say how many fish are there? And we had planned to do some experiments on board Arne Fredriksson uh, to estimate this. And then we wanted to do some kind of modeling of uh, eDNA distribution using drift model and, um, and some kind of ecosystem models that were already published when we started the project. So, and the ultimate goal was really to assess if the eDNA signals uh, reflected detection and abundance of Kaplan that we were observing with the monitoring acoustic survey. So one of the things that went really wrong in the project already is that the, uh, the quantification experiment on the boat didn't go as planned. So we couldn't perform it, it totally failed. And so what we did instead was to try to find correlation between the eDNA concentration and the uh, acoustic values directly without having any experiments where we could confish and see how much DNA they were releasing. So a uh, little bit about the sampling uh, strategy. So we used uh, Niskin's bottles, like you, you can see there. And uh, this nice, uh, on the right side, you have the uh, pumping system that was developed for it. It's the total right one with the eight 
uh, plastic supports. You can actually see a glass system there that we are using to filter uh, eDNA. So, and these are the stations that we did samples in 2019 and 2020 on the East Greenland area, where Kaplan is during the, um, the Kaplan survey. Um, and the blue triangles that you have there, the reason why they are blue is that because those are stations that we indeed repeated from one year to another one. So it's 2019 and 2020 in the exact same position. And we did uh, five depths. So we filter water at five different depths, which was surface, 20 meters, 50 meters, 200 meters, and 500 meters, or the deepest part where we could uh, actually get water samples. So in total, we had more than 600 uh, eDNA samples um, through the water column in the East Greenland area, and we all analyzed them. Uh, so let's go a little bit into the tedious part now, the genetic part. Um, so one of the markers that we really use very often for species identification is the um, cytochrome oxidase subunit one uh, from the mitochondrial DNA, it's a gene. It is quite conserved from species, but, but um, so you can amplify it with kind of universal primers, but you can also design primers so that you will actually amplify the part of the genes that is just from the species you are targeting, and that's what we did. So the first thing you have to do is to, I'm not sure you're gonna see that, is it? Yeah, that's okay. So this is what we call the consensus uh, sequence of the Kaplan, which means that we amplify this region for 94 uh, different Kaplan and then looked at the average sequences. And then you have a typical sequences with some sites that are varying. And you compare these to uh, the 28 species that are below. So the upper part is the uh, Kaplan one and the lower part are all the 28 species that we have been adding in the, uh, in the group to see the difference between Kaplan and the other species. And that's how you design your primers because you're looking at the area which is different between Kaplan and the others species that you have in the waters around him. So, and we compared it to cod, mackerel, Atlantic herring, salmon, brown trout, rainbow trout, lots of species, Atlantic and spotted wolfish, uh, redfish, oceanic and deep sea ecotypes of redfish, um, the Norway redfish, the golden redfish. So most of the species we could, um, we could think of in the marine environments. Not all of them, because that would have been a lot of work, but you know, at least the most common one. So what we did then is that we developed a framework for the level of detection and the level of quantification of the DNA of Kaplan. And you can see there is an amplification plot example here where we uh, had it samples of Kaplan with known concentration from 10 nanogram to uh, 0 .00, 0 0.001 nanogram per milliliter. So we actually did those solution. We took DNA from Kaplan and we dissolved them at certain concentrations. And each time that we did a run to, um, to test the eDNA from water, we had those samples in the, in the plates. So this was constantly run with our samples. And uh, it actually helped us to, um, to design a framework that will help us to calculate concentration of eDNA in, in the water. So you have also two examples of stations there that is uh, on the table on the side, which is purple, the station 414, and uh, orange, the 420. And you can see that uh, we are detecting at 50 meters um, eDNA of Kaplan in the purple one, and that's the small curves that is at the end of the, uh, of the graph. And we are detecting Kaplan in many other areas in the 420. And that's why you have lots of orange curves. Uh, but you see that we also had tusk, link, mackerel, haddock, and cods in the, um, in, the, uh, in the PCR reaction, and we didn't amplify any of this DNA. And then we had water sample as a blank, just to say, if we put just water, still water there, are you gonna detect DNA? And then we don't detect anything, which means that you don't have contamination in the lab or in the process from the boat to the lab. So this has to be test tested constantly, because if you have something in the water, then you have a problem. And if you detect species that you're not targeting, then that's also a problem. Uh, so the level of detection is just to show you how we do. We actually repeat several times amplification of the standard curves that we have with standard concentration and compare that to what we have in our samples. And then you define area where you will say, okay, above this concentration, then I'm detecting Kaplan, and above this concentration, I'm able to quantify how many Kaplins are there. And this is what we did, and we came out with, oh, I went back, sorry. Two concentrations, so, um, which is the level of detection that's 
3.2, 10 to the minus 4 nanogram per microliters. And then the level of quantific quantification is 6, 10 to the minus 4 nanogram per microliters. So everything that is lower than 3.3, 10 to the minus 4, um, and that we detect as eDNA, then we don't consider it to be a detection. We, consider, we consider it to, the, to be a trace, but not a real detection. The fish might not be there under this concentration. And then in the quantification, we try not to quantify anything if the concentration is lower than, than the LOQ. So what we did also during this project is actually do repeats uh, in the lab. So each time that we had the DNA samples, we did three PCR to try to amplify the eDNA of Kaplan. So, and you see that, um, so sometimes it works really well. So the CT, I didn't say that, but that's a very in, important uh, columns. It's uh, the cycle thresholds. So it is the number of cycles that you need to do to actually detect uh, eDNA of Kaplan. And the eDNA C, it's the eDNA concentration. So we use both of them to actually be able to assess if we are detecting Kaplan or not. But you see there from 50 to 500 meters the, in the samples in the, in the first run, we are actually detecting quite a lot of Kaplan. And we are also detecting it in the second run and in the third run, which means that at the end, you have a quite high concentration of eDNA of Kaplan. So we do an average. It's not a real value. It's an average of three different amplifications that we are doing to have to assess the concentration of DNA. But you see that, for example, at 20 meters, sometimes we just don't detect anything. There is nothing. It's, and then you see that for the first uh, run, that is run one. But then for the others, we are detecting something. So it happens that the first, uh, sorry, the first PCR don't do anything, don't amplify anything, but that the others are. And we also have to do repeat of stations. So sometime when we have time during the service, which is not that often, we need to repeat the stations just to be sure that if we don't find anything in the first run, we are not finding anything in the second run. And in the ocean, that's actually quite difficult because you have lots of currents and DNA disperse quite quickly. Uh, so I'm showing, I'm showing just a very nice example where we have blanks and everything and where we are actually not detecting anything in the repeats and in the original stations, but we still have trace and no complication of data because I didn't want to discuss the other one where we actually have the first run detection and then the second run no detection, but we can discuss that later on. Uh, so what about results? Enough about the uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we did uh, samples 2019 and 2020, like I said, and here you have an acoustic signal uh, grading figures, which is showing you where the Kaplan was in 2019 based on the survey. And here is the eDNA results. So that's the eDNA results with everything. Everything we detected, every single concentration, without level of detection into account or anything. But if you actually look at the level of detection, then this is what we have. This is where we are actually really detecting Kaplan. The rest is just trace or contamination in our samples. That could be one solution. So we did the same thing in 2020 where we had many more Kaplan than in 2019. I forgot to say that, but in 2019, we didn't have that many Kaplan in the world. Uh, and there in the eDNA, we also detected quite a lot of, of, um, of uh, eDNA of Kaplan. And this is just all the water column. It's not 0 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters, 200 meters, 500 meters. It's just all the water column that we combine together to see if the horizontal representation of this could actually reflect the same thing as the acoustic. Of course, some of those dots in the eDNA are due to detection at 20 meters. Some others are 200 meters and some other at, at 50 meters. And uh, this, these are actually results that are under revision right now in, in eDNA journals. And that's actually what one of the referee asked us. They asked us to separate the different layers of the oceans to see where the Kaplan was really compared to the acoustic. Uh, I will come back later on to this. But again, if you look at level of detection, this is actually what, what we are detecting as real presence of Kaplan. The rest is just uh, probably traces of Kaplan due to currents or due to the presence in previous days. Um, another thing that we try to do is that, um, I don't know if you remember those blue triangles that I showed you at the beginning on the map of sampling. So those are two transects that we repeated from 2019 and 2020. So here's the results that we have for 2019 on transect at 72 north degrees and uh, 70 degrees north also. Uh, so you can see the results are different uh, for the eDNA in the, 
in the transects. But the interesting part was when you start to um, compare this with acoustic signals in the same transects. And you see that, okay, if you try to report the acoustic signals that we have on the right side to the eDNA graph, it's kind of fitting a little bit, but not perfectly. And, uh, and you see that you also have, because it's a, it's, a, it's a graph that is actually interpolating quite a lot the eDNA data. So that's not really true data. Um, that you have detection in area where you actually don't have KPIN. And uh, this is one of the problems that we have been having is that we actually didn't sample water enough on transects to be able to say anything about what is happening in the, in the uh, dispersing and sinking rate of eDNA. So you see for the uh, 70 degree north also that where we are detecting KPIN, we have very low uh, eDNA detection levels there. Uh, but we have a very nice one uh, at this point, the square one, and, and then there, we actually don't have any Kplin if we look at the acoustics. So the nice thing is that you have 72 degree north and 70 degree north just on the same slide, because when you have nothing in this square um, on the 70 degree north, you are wondering, you know, is it not some kind of dispersing from the currents from the 72 degree north? Because actually this, the currents here will be just north-south. So there is a possibility that actually we are not detecting eDNA in the right areas in some of those transects simply because of the currents, that the fish was area up and the DNA was dispersed by the currents to the next station. So what we are basically thinking of is that uh, to be really able to understand all those things, we actually need to use the eDNA data that we have been collecting now to do drift models and sinking rates models. So, and I say anybody interested, well, there are already people working on this in the house, so I hope that this will be solved soon. Uh, so I could show you the same graphs for uh, 2020, and uh, here is an example again of the same transect. So you see that from one year to another one, the detection of eDNA and the acoustics in North are changing quite a lot. That's quite normal, you don't expect that to be stable from years to years. But again, this time you see a li little bit more um, you see a better correlation between the eDNA concentration and the uh, acoustic signal, at least in the upper part for the 72 degrees north transect, but not for the lower part. Again, you can see that you have lots of Kplin detected with the acoustic in the surface, but in seven, at 70 degrees north, but then we don't detect any eDNA there. Yeah, that's the one that corresponds. Uh, but another way that we have been asked to present those things based on the revision is this one, and this is just an example that we quickly did with our with my coders, and uh, because referees were asking us actually, how is the eDNA detected compared to water masses? And then one way to look at the water masses is the salinity and temperature. So there you have the temperature profiles on this transect 72 degrees north in 2020, um, and then you have the salinity profile on the right side. Uh, you see also the bottom, that's the, the, the white part, that's the bottom of the of the sea. The blue dots are actually the acoustic signals where we detect um, Kplin, and then the other dots are actually samples of eDNA. And the biggest concentration that we are getting is uh, these yellow dots and these small gray dots. They're really close to the uh, to the um, acoustic signals of, of Kplin. The rest is actually just uh, traces again, and, and it's not considered to be detections. So representing it like this is a little bit uh, more conceptual. We see more what is happening compared to this kind of graph. So that is what we are actually doing right now. Um, so the next step that we did was to try to apply eDNA occupancy models um, to our data that are usually based on repeat station repeat depths and everything, but we managed to rig our data to fit them into the model. And uh, the first things we saw and that we were quite happy about it is that you actually have a correlation between the eDNA concentration and the NASC value, so the acoustic value of the Kplin. Even if it's not totally in the same spot, if you take the, uh, the closest spot of acoustic uh, signals, then you realize that there is a correlation between your concentration of eDNA and Kplin. Uh, and then we played with environmental variables just to see if we could see a pattern there. And we took like salinity, temperature, and uh, uh, velocity, current velocity. And the first thing you see, it's the graph A, then you have the more current speed you have, the more eDNA you detect. Um, and for the salinity, that's actually the reverse. Um, 
the eDNA is not detected above uh, 32 PSU in salinity. So there is a decrease from 32 to above, there is a decrease on eDNA uh, concentration. And then the last one is temperature also. After two degrees, there is a trend in decreasing concentration of eDNA um, with temperature. So this can be due to many things. It can be due to uh, well, current, current speed, we know, you know if, if, if the fish is actually present in very uh, rapid water masses, then you are likely to find lots of DNA there. But salinity and temperature can be due to different things also. That could be characteristic of the currents, but it could also be that at higher temperature, there is a higher metabolism, and then the eDNA is actually uh, used by other organisms as an energy sources, like I'm thinking about bacteria and all those things. Um, but then I will say, you know, we faced lots of challenge during this project, many challenge. It was not that easy to, uh, to collect the samples. Um, it was difficult to organize and it was not a eDNA monitoring. It was done during the Kaplan cruises, which means that there are lots of things that we couldn't do. And one of them was the eDNA production and shedding rights of the Kaplan. We actually don't know how much the Kaplan is releasing when it's leaving in the water. So that's a very uh, difficult thing to, um, to imagine. And you see that from one species to another one, uh, this rate is actually changing. We know that even in the marine environments, some species actually shed more DNA than others in the environment. So you will detect those species much more easily than others, uh, basically. And then the other problem we had it was decay rate. We actually didn't know at all how long the eDNA of Kaplan was staying at one station and how long it was staying in the environment. Uh, so you see here, there, I'm giving you two examples, the one of European flounders and sticklebacks, and this is done by experiment, and that, that is what we were supposed to do with the experiment, but we couldn't. Uh, it's just to take a number of fish, put them in a tank, release them, and see how long the DNA was staying there. Uh, so you can see that the from, for the flounders, it's approximately seven days, but for the sticklebacks, it could be less than one day. Uh, from the repeats where we actually found uh, DNA of Kaplan, uh, so a station, we do a station, we do eDNA study, and we come back an hour and a half later. So in the first time we detect eDNA, in the second one we are not detecting eDNA. So that can be an information that, you know, uh, probably not that it's degraded in one hour and a half, but that it's gone due to currents, you know. So there are lots of parameters that we, uh, we don't control there and that we need to investigate a little bit more. So like I said, um, to continue, well, we need to basically uh, work on this decay and drifting and sinking rates uh, in the future if we want to continue to work on eDNA with Kaplan. The framework is there, but there is more to do. But still, I mean, it's not, it's not that bad. Um, I mean, there is, a, there is a nice correlation between the eDNA concentration we see, at least on the horizontal levels, and the, the distribution and the range of the species. This corresponds quite well. It's getting much more complicated when we are starting to add the third dimension, the depth, because then we really need to have a dedicated monitoring survey to understand what is happening and, and if we want to see the impact of the water masses, which I think is the most important thing to study uh, when you're doing eDNA, specifically in the open ocean because the currents there are quite important. And uh, yeah, if you want to summarize a little bit the eDNA occupancy model results, you can probably pinpoint to the fact that this is pointing out to the East Greenland currents, you know, all indication that you find more eDNA of Kaplan along the East um, Greenlandic current. Yeah, and uh, so like I said, this is a review paper now in, uh, in Environmental uh, DNA Journal. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Really nice presentation. Impressive uh, work. Uh, just a technical question. The, uh, the quantity of uh, DNA, well, yeah. what's the unit? How do you uh, quantify? Is it uh, how many reads of DNA you get? Or uh, No, no, that's, that's concentration directly. Yeah, it's yeah. concentration directly. It's based directly. on the city cycle of the, um, of the QPCR. Oh, QPCR. Yeah. All right. Thank you. No reads. No reads. Yeah. So no PCR uh, prior to, to the QPCR. No. Directly quantif quantifi quantification. No. Yes. Any more questions? 
Thank you for your presentation. Uh, what I want to ask is, <coughs> you tend to find DNA which has drifted with the current, but not at the spot where the cable in is. So uh, my question is, are the cable ins not uh, ex ex extruding DNA continuously? Uh, yeah, they are, but I guess it's it's depend probably we don't know actually. I I don't know. I'm <laughs> you know nobody has done that work that work before. So uh, I'm I'm not sure they should be. I mean, all of us are doing that more or less at different rates. Um, I guess it really depends on uh, on the biology of the species and 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 the currents around and everything. I mean, I don't really have answer to that, honestly. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite surprised that uh, that for some of those stations we did, we had cabling around and we didn't find DNA. Uh, and the main reason is that we had specific targeted school samples. Like, you know, they send the CTD in the center of the school. And then we, we did that four times, and four times we got DNA in the high concentration. And for some of them that we did during the, uh, the, uh, the transects, then we didn't get it. So I, I, I have a hard time to understand this, basically. Um, but it could be used to, to, to so many things, you know. It's, uh, I know that we are not the only one to, uh, to have this problem. I mean, I know people who have been basically taking water samples in pods of kilowells, and they, never be, they, they were never able to identify, you know, any eDNA from kilowells in the water samples. They found lots of things, but no kilowells. So it, it could be due to different things, you know. It could be due to the fact that your genetic technique is not perfect. That, that can happen. And that there, is, there are inhibitors in PCR also. You know, we try. We had problem with inhibitors. We had to remove quite a lot of inhibitors. But sometimes it might not work, and you don't know it. You know, it's just random things. Also, that happens. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I will have to digest <laughs> what you said, but. It, I'm wondering if you could give your opinion on what, why there are so uh, much variability in, in the decay of DNA. <laughs> uh, these are fish, and uh, not, it's not uh, so different which you showed as an example for that. Uh, I Is, think have you yeah. any ideas? <laughs> I think it is a little bit. I mean, if you go back to DNA, not the eDNA, to the old DNA, you know, uh, you can say it's fish also, and I've been working on fish for 20 years, I think, but you still have species for which it's very difficult to extract DNA from tissues. Uh, one of those fish, for example, is herring. Uh, it's, it's an horrible fish. It's, it's really hard to get good quality DNA from herring when you have tissue samples because of the fat. And it's, it's actually the same for capelin. If you do uh, DNA, it's very hard to get uh, DNA. So, I mean, there, there, there is some kind of biological things happening on those species, and that's why the decay rate is different, you know, and also the skin, the roughness of the skin and, you know, and the, uh, the, the, the scales or all those kind of things that could be very different um, from species to species. That's why the decay rate and also the, um, the um, oh, I forgot the name now, the um, emission rate of DNA of those species is different. So you don't, you don't lose cells at the same same speed if you are an anchovy or if you are a, a flounder. And then there is age also is another problem. When you have uh, fish older that are almost, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure that if you were to take eDNA samples during the spawning time of capelin, then you will have a higher concentration because they are investing a lot in, in reproductive efforts. So, that, you know, they, they are probably losing quite a lot of cells at that moment. There are, there are lots of factors, you know, it's, um, and we almost know no, none of them. <laughs> So uh, we know we know a little bit of some of them, but not all of them, you know. But I would say it's it's proper biology that is actually explaining those rights. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So thank you very much. <laughs>